So like, wh where am I looking? Or what's You're it? looking at me. Okay, for sure. My name is Corey Rogan. Um, application number 183. I was one of the few applicants to get in access early on the seller account before 10 a.m. Man, I'm at a position right now where I'm happy and I'm mad. It's gonna be 1992 all over again. We allowed 802 people to take financial risk to participate. My name is Corey Rogan. Life growing up, um, you know, born and raised in Los Angeles, attended Crenshaw High School. I'm the oldest out of five siblings. Uh, my mom pretty much was incarcerated most of my life. She just got out serving 10 years for nonviolent drug crimes. Growing up, didn't really have her around. I was able to go to college and everything like that. Went to Tuskegee University, got my degree in sales and marketing. This opportunity with cannabis is pretty much one of the touchiest things that's going on. If we have no market share in this, we lost as a people. When I say as a people, as you know, African Americans, as you know, Hispanics as well, not being able to have any market share in the cannabis retail business right now is like it's, 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 we're missing out on a great opportunity. My name is Raheem Giddens. I'm number 713 in line for the social equity program. Growing up in Los Angeles, at first I didn't start smoking until like my senior year in high school. And then I really became more of a consumer in college. And then I saw more of how cannabis was more like business than it was more just getting high. You know, people were selling weed making transactions and making money in college. So that's when I saw like, hey, this is probably an opportunity for legalization. And since we're in LA, let's take part of that. Raheem's my best friend. Pretty much met Raheem my junior year of high school at Crenshaw High. College together as well, Ski University. You know, I'm a godfather of his, of his child. And, uh, you know, been the best of friends. And without Raheem, pretty much put in the ear to social equity, I wouldn't even, you know, be in this position, honestly. Cannabis was an opportunity for business. Me and Corey, we always talked about that. Like, man, we smoke so much weed, if we don't start making money from this, we really lost. So that's when I started really doing my research in 2018, and really 2017 to see like, okay, how can we get in? I knew we didn't have a capital, so what I did was I just started looking and when I heard about the social equity program, that's when I said, hey, let's, let's do the retail because the opportunity is, uh, is there. This program is really for us. If we could find the right investment, if we could find the right opportunity, we can make it happen. And that's what I was conveying to Corey. Social equity program was an opportunity to operate on an even playing field as an entrepreneur. And for the community that has gone through so much because of the war on drugs, lost so much, having some kind of legislation in LA that was gonna address that and be kind of recompense for that uh, seemed like the right thing to do. Uh, you know, when the social equity program was initially announced, I was, in awe, we were excited um, that there would even be such a, I don't even know when that's heard of. Folks have been talking about 40 acres and a mule and reparations and uh, never had I seen any sort of government program to an industry. They couldn't repair the war on drugs, but they could actually help with real community development. Uh, I know a lot of people in the community had, had a lot of different dreams, of, primarily on how to give back with, with the money that they would uh, earn from these businesses. You know, I spent about a year and a half leading up, working towards submitting this application. LA had you have to verify your social equity status, right? For myself, I had to go back and get school records, old uh, utility bills, 
But then again, you know, outside of myself, we held classes, we held workshops, we actually um, verified over 250 social equity applicants. It took a lot of work because you had to uh, have a property, you had to have a lease or a deed on the property uh, in order that was compliant for cannabis retail to be able to apply. In the city of LA, you're paying quadruple the amount of your rent when the property owner knows that you have a cannabis property. So you just can't go down the street and rent someplace for $2,000. You're gonna easily pay nine to $12,000 a month. If you're a social equity applicant, you're low income, right? So there's no way in the world, there are very few exceptions that um, you did not have to find an investor in order to participate. Early on, you had real investors. You know, there were folks that really intended on doing right, so I don't mean to disparage everybody. So the, the problems that we had in dealing with the investors was greed. You know, no one, no one truly wanted to um, invest in social equity. Um, and we were looking for those socially conscious investors and they did not exist. Um, they were predators. Then everything about the contracts that they were putting together was to totally rape and pillage every intent of the social equity program, every right that that social equity program, every chance of generational wealth. Um, they eliminated that word by word in every single agreement um, that I read. I'm aware of cases where investors weren't able to deliver everything they promised when it came time and, and basically ghosted their applicants. Investors were stringing applicants along, promising them property and investment where they hadn't always secured that property. And when it came down to it, maybe they promised five applicants a partnership, but then they only had one or two properties. Those other three applicants thought they had a deal, and then at the last minute uh, had everything pulled out from under them and with no time to salvage their chances at applying. We don't have access to our passwords. Let's try to figure it out. And that's what happened. I didn't have no access to my email or to uh, my Excel portal. The way they had it set up is just like, you know, if you was to ask for your password or try to get your password, it would mess up the process of submitting your application. That's what we were told. Excella is actually the number one GovTech software uh, company in the country. They are the software, the tech company that put together the online submission process for the city of LA. They contracted Excella to create a website platform for people who are applying and uh, getting licensed uh, in all kinds of different areas. They contracted Excella to do the licensing for the cannabis department. There were 802 total submissions to the city of LA for uh, this retail round. And how many licenses was the city supposed to get? There's only 100 licenses available to give out. And so it would be the first 100 applicants who were able to apply on uh, this website um, within seconds. At the time, being the site was down, you, you couldn't even go and log into your, you know, log into trying to get a forgotten password. You had to go physically downtown to try to get access to your password. I went to um, DCR prior to uh, trying to get my password reset. So it was a um, staff member there that was able to help me reset my password and gave me a temporary password. We made the inquiry with Asmara. I will never forget that name. At first, they was kind of pushing back like, hey, I don't think we could do it, but she was really looking out like, hey, we're gonna make sure like your passwords are good. 
after we decided we was going to get our access to our passwords, we basically started looking at, you know, who we can go to. We had four days left and it's kind of like, who do we search for? You know, we had people who, they might have a little capital, they might be able to find some property in this little bit amount of time and might be able to partner with them to do something. I start searching the web and I'm like, maybe it's people looking for people. Raheem basically came to me with the, um, with the company called Haven. Haven, uh, they were looking for people. I reached out for them. It was like really a process going through it. It was like going up the ladder. You talk to this person, they kind of clear you. you. Talk to that person. You know, just kind of trusting voices, trusting, trusting vibes. We basically went and uh, met with them, told them our story and everything like that. They let us know that they had property already, gave us contracts. We read them ourselves, you know what I'm saying, made a decision. And that was that. Yes. So run me through the morning of September 3rd. The morning of September 3rd, it was really locked in for me. Like, for sure, for sure. It was locked in. I was like, okay, we did the hard part. We found the investors in this little time. We got our pastors locked in, we working with some people experienced, like what else am I missing? So I'm at the apartment, I'm chilling, you know, I'm chilling I'm on the laptop, you know, they were doing it on my behalf. So I get a notification a little around 10, uh, just like, hey, um, you know, we're not able to get in. And it's not my password. They doing a password reset and then I'm not able to get in. It's saying that the server is down and will reopen at 10 a.m. But this is from 10 a.m. to 10.29 that it's saying that. Man, it's crazy. Um, my experience is a lot different than Corey's, man. We had the password reset. Everything was, you know, really the same leaving, leading up. He got in early and I got in late, you know? I was, you know, one of the applicants that got early access, but it definitely wasn't intentional, to, you know, to try to get any type of access, you know, early access to try to get any type of gain. It was more so by refreshing and trying to keep logging in, I was able to gain access somehow like that. So anybody else was in that position, they would submit, submit their application the same way. Well, the room that I was in actually had the uh, applicant who was the number one submission. And uh, this applicant had gone to the DCR early that morning um, because he needed to reset his password. He got back into the room maybe about 9.45. We were like, well, check your password to make sure that, you know, it works. So at about 9.49, we check his password and uh, the system opens up. <laughs> Any application that was started before 10 a.m was normalized to a 10 a.m. start time to ensure that these applicants were not unfairly advantaged and to also ensure that other applicants were not unfairly disadvantaged. Ms. Doctor, if I could just interject, this is a very important point. I just want to make sure that we've done our due diligence and we've confirmed that the entire universe of applicants that were able to enter the system prior to 10, 10 o'clock was a total of two. So what we, what we can say with confidence is that any application that was submitted prior to 10 a.m. was normalized to a 10 a.m. start time. I didn't know. I don't know. You could actually normalize uh, the early applications fairly. I think they just normalized them inappropriately and it wasn't fair. What you could do is normalize those early applications based on their login time rather than the time that they started the application. Because that's actually an apples to apple comparison. If I started at 10 a.m., I had to log in, go through the process. People who got in early, if you start them from their login time and apply it to 10 o'clock, that's apples to apples. If you did that, you'd have a different order and you'd see who fairly got in first come, first serve, top 100. They really focus on the person that really got in early, but they never say anything about the people that got in late who had their passwords reset as well. And having a conversation about normalizing their time, you know, it's like, that's never a conversation. 
Um, I really don't think it's, you know, it's fair to even do a do-over. For what reason? You know, a lot of people already took the time out to fill out an application. So I think that that would be, you know, a whole nother other long process. If you say do it over, who's paying the money for all these months' rent because of the city's negligence? So yeah, do it over. If you plan on compensating all of us who have been holding on to properties and have endured this extra six months to a year expense because you were negligent. To the rest of the applicants, I would like to say that, you know, um, you know, definitely I'm with you guys. I'm for everybody getting submitted. This is definitely, you know, um, a tough time for everybody. Just seeing like how technology can really be a flaw and how that can affect a lot of people is like, damn, this shit is real. Either big tech get messed up, big city get messed up, or little people get messed up. And obviously what's happening is really Excella. Like if we want to paint the picture, we can't really say DCR. Excella, they the ones that really got to talk. If one person got in like myself, that means that the system is flawed. There's a point where the cover-up becomes fraudulent. And especially when it's at the expense of people's economic hardships, and especially when it's about a program that was designed to, to rectify the harm. 